Greetings. I'm Victor Ludlow, a professor of ancient scripture here at BYU, and we'd like to welcome you to our discussion of the chapters of Isaiah. With me today are some of my colleagues from BYU. Across the table is Jeff Chadwick, who is actually from our church history department, a specialist in the Middle East. Welcome. Thank you. Jeff. To his right is Richard Draper, who is one of our New Testament scholars here in the college, and we welcome you, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Vic. And Paul Hoskison and I are longtime friends. He's one of our great ancient Near Eastern linguists on our faculty. We're glad to have you with us today, Paul. It's good to be here. Today we're going to continue our discussion of some Isaiah chapters that are found in the Book of Mormon. It's the second major set of Book of Mormon chapters. We're all usually familiar that there was a big block of Isaiah, specifically chapters 2 through 14, that are quoted there in 2 Nephi. But these chapters 48 through 54 are also found, all of them, in the Book of Mormon. It's just that they're scattered through different books as quoted and cited by different individuals. We just got into these chapters in the last uh, roundtable discussion with chapter 48 which along with chapter 49, where we'll begin today, was quoted by Nephi in 1st Nephi. This is right after Lehi and his family had arrived in the New World. And as we made some comparisons, uh, it, chapters 48 and 49 deal with covenant Israel. And covenant blessings, but covenant warnings that are given in these chapters. Apparently, they were developed by Isaiah to help teach the southern kingdom of Judah after the northern tribes of Israel were taken by the Assyrians, after Assyria had actually attacked and almost destroyed Judah. He wanted Judah to begin as a covenant people, and so he gave them some important teachings that Nephi saw relevance and application to his people in the New World. They had also undergone some great challenges making their way to their new land of destiny. Now chapter uh, 49 is uh, where he addresses covenant Israel almost like in a court setting with some different statements and accusations. And to set the stage for this, uh, let's just take a minute and talk about some of the basic elements of a covenant and of a covenant people because you'll find all of these elements in these two chapters, 48 and 49. In fact, they're almost like a, a Reader's Digest condensed version of the book of Deuteronomy where Moses is trying to do the same thing. And the basic elements of a covenant are an introduction of the covenant parties. There's some type of a historical context that is presented. There are certain stipulations, conditions of the covenant that are laid out. There's some type of ordinances or rites associated with the formal institution of the covenant, such as baptism that's mentioned at the beginning of chapter 48. And in the Old Testament there would have been some kind of sacrificial offering or something of that time. Right, I, this idea of a cutting a covenant, some yes. type of a the slaughtering of a sacrificial animal or something. And uh, But then there are certain consequences of the covenant that are laid out, and this is particularly in chapter 49. There are witnesses that are called forth and are a part of the whole covenant process. And then the idea that it's in the record, it's in the scriptures, this idea of perpetuation and continuation is a part of it. I might want to just point out too, Vic, that uh, this, this contains a covenant, not an agreement. That agreement is a, is a, a equal to equal party situation where a covenant is something that uh, is imposed by one who is over and the people have the right to accept or reject the covenant, albeit with consequence in each instance. Right, and so it's a, it's a solemn agreement, I guess we could say, where it initiates with the divine, mm -hmm. and it's here with the people. Now, one of the problems that I think Bible readers and Latter-day Saints have with these <laughs> Isaiah passages are not just what's there, but how it's presented. Uh, Paul, help us understand, how is it that Isaiah packages this in, 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 in such great literary form, and yet it's so frustrating for us to try <laughs> to understand it? Isaiah is, is probably one of the greatest poets who ever lived. Uh, you know, if you read the Shakespeare or, or Goethe or Pushkin or even Omar Khayyam, 
You have wonderful literature, but Isaiah is every bit as good a poet as any of those, but he's talking about sacred things, which makes him, in my mind anyway, much more of a poet and much more important as a writer than any of the others. And he, uh, as he says in chapter 50, this is an introduction to this section of Isaiah, the Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. The, the Joseph Smith translation adds a little bit there. It says, uh, uh, to speak a word in season unto thee, O house of Israel, when ye are weary. Isaiah's calling is to speak to Israel when it is weary, when it has forsaken the Lord and uh, try and cheer them up and say, hey, there's a better way. Now to do this, he's got to be careful uh, not to offend anybody uh, by being too explicit about the kinds of things that Israel had rebelled against, uh, um, uh, too explicit about the, the Messiah and who he's going to be. So Isaiah is going to use a lot of big words, even in Hebrew, and he's going to use some beautiful illusions and, uh, allusions and uh, metaphors and allegory uh, to, to get across his point. And one of them is the one that you're talking about there with the, that you just mentioned, Victor, about the covenant that is made. So if you go back to chapter 49, verse 3, this is introduced as, as the kind of covenant that you mentioned, Richard, here. Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. The relationship is spelled out there. Israel is the servant. God is the master. Very important. Uh, these first few verses here also are a part of one of these servant songs that have been mentioned earlier. We found the first example of this back with chapter 42. This is the second one. It basically goes through uh, these first verses of, of, of chapter 49. Help us out, Jeff. What is a servant song or who is, could be this servant? Well, one of the things we have to remember about Isaiah, when we read Isaiah, and, and we see this also in the other books of the Old Testament, it was the manner of prophesying among the Jews that Nephi talked so much about in 2 Nephi 25. And that is that these prophecies and even the, uh, the symbols and the uh, metaphors in them are very often uh, interpretable on multiple levels. Uh, when I teach Isaiah in a classroom, I like to say Isaiah is a multiple-use prophet, and so is much of the Old Testament. So that the servant in these servant poems or these servant songs uh, can be interpreted, uh, I think, primarily as the Messiah of Israel, Jesus Christ. The servant of all servants. Sure. But because he is the king of Israel, he is inherently part of Israel and even reflective of Israel. So that the servant can also be interpreted as Israel itself doing the work of the Lord. And in Isaiah 49, the first few verses, what we specifically see is the servant speaking as Israel. Israel is personified as a person. And in fact, you have Israel uh, speaking to Israel, almost like the servant here is, is speaking to his own alter ego. And what we have here happening is essentially a personified triumphant Israel, who knows the end from the beginning, speaking to Israel in around 700 B.C. that's been beaten down and deported and only Jerusalem has been left of it. So triumphant Israel in 49 is speaking to downtrodden Israel, telling it the day of your redemption and restoration will come. Now we might want to point out too that the transition is between verse 3 and 4 when the Lord says in verse 3, Thou art my servant, O Israel. He is, he is uh, talking about this, this latter-day, strong, vibrant, uh, righteous Israel. And then that Israel then responds with uh, verse 4, I have labored in vain, I have spent my strength for naught, and in vain, yet, sh yet surely judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. You, you, you see the, uh, the, the labor that has been given and, and not successful, and yet this positive Israel knows that there's going to be a tremendous outcome in the end, and then, and then we pick up that momentum from there. Let me just shed another little dimension on this verse 3 that we've all loved and quoted here. Uh, <clears throat> Thou art my servant, O Israel. Now, Israel literally means one who prevails with God, with Elohim. And so, yes, it applies to his son that definitely prevails with the father, but also with a covenant people who can prevail, like Abraham, like Jacob, and others who could prevail with God. And 
receive certain promises and blessings. So uh, this could expand not only to ancient Israel, but could apply to those of modern covenant Israel. If they are honoring their covenants, they can prevail with God. They can be a true Israel, one who prevails with God. Uh, but as, as you mentioned there, Richard, unfortunately, verse 4, we often feel like we have done a lot of work in raising families, home teaching, whatever, <laughs> and it just not. doesn't seem to be appreciated. So it's not the, only the ancient prophets <laughs> that felt frustrated as a servant of the Lord. That's downtrodden Israel speaking in verse 4. I've yeah, labored uh, and, and it's been in vain, but, but, but it's, it's triumphant Israel that understands the end from the beginning that's speaking in verses 1 and 2 and 3 saying, the Lord has called me from afar from my mother's womb. And in verse 2 we have that beautiful allusion to Israel when it understands its destiny being a polished shaft in the quiver of the Lord. Mm -hmm. and I think it's important here to realize also that the, the Israel that understands and that, uh, this, that uh, is going to fulfill all of this is now, it's today. It's the Israel of today which is saying, you know, this will all come to fruition. Don't worry about your, your troubles back in 700 BC. It's going to work out in the end. And I really like that coming out of verse 5. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be a servant to bring Jacob again to him. So that, that the, uh, the modern Israel's job is then to reach out to the whole house of Israel and to bring them forward, to bring them into the kingdom, to bring them to the, the latter-day Messiah. Right. It's, it's interesting, too, that one of the greatest prophets of Israel ever to live, uh, uh, speaking now not of Isaiah, but Joseph Smith, used verse 2 when referring to himself. Yeah, good point. Called yes. himself a, a polished shaft a polished in the shaft. quiver of the yes. Lord. In fact, I like the way Joseph expresses this, and he obviously is using some of the imagery of this verse. Uh, in his teachings, he says, I am like a huge rough stone rolling down from a high mountain, and the only polishing I get is once when some corner gets rubbed off by coming in contact with something else, striking with accelerated force against religious bigotry, priestcraft, lawyercraft, doctorcraft, lying <laughs> editors, suborned judges and jurors, and the authority of perjured executives, backed by mobs, blasphemers, licentious and corrupt men and women. Boy, well, he summarizes, all hell knocking off a corner here and a corner there. Thus I will become a smooth and polished shaft in the quiver of the Almighty. Just like this imagery there where the Lord has hidden him in his quiver, ready to come forth to do the great work that he was able to do. You know, it's interesting. The prophet Joseph Smith seems to have done just what the Savior commanded, and that is to search Isaiah diligently because not only in his own teachings, but in the revelations that come through him in the Doctrine and Covenants, there is more imagery from the book of Isaiah in Joseph Smith's uh, uh, literary donations or, or contributions to us than, than almost any other biblical source. All right, well, let's... Uh, Move Could I just mention something before sure. we run on to, because chapter 49, we wouldn't want to miss that great uh, imagery of the gathering. The, that's the whole point. Victorious Israel knows and is telling downtrodden Israel, just wait, in the latter days you'll be gathered and, gathered. And starting in verse 12, we see in the latter days places where that gathering will come from. Verse 12 says, Behold, these, referring to returning Israel, shall come from far. Lo, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sinim, which, by the way, is just a translated, a transliterated Hebrew word. And uh, in modern Hebrew, of course, uh, the word Sin is China. Mm -hmm. In modern terms, it would be the land of the Chinese, but the nation-state system that we have today didn't exist in those days. And the land of Sinim in Isaiah is a reference to the Far East. Yeah. In other uh, words, Asia. The Israel would East. come back yep. from where they had scattered to, which was not just Assyria, but over into East Asia, into North Asia, and of course West into Europe. Mm -hmm. And from there, all over the world. The, yes. the gathering of Israel is to be worldwide because that's where the Lord scattered them. Just, just one other point, very briefly, Vic, and that is in verse 6 we see that the raising is not just to the tribes of Jacob, but uh, as the Lord says, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles. So we see the, the leavening of the gospel through Israel to all the world. All the world. And, and captive Israel is mentioned again in verse 24 at the end of the chapter. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? And the answer, of course, for Isaiah is 
Absolutely. Yeah, indeed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so you get then in, in chapter 50, the resumption of the covenant that you talked about earlier, except this time in the metaphor of the relationship between a husband and a wife. Now let's, and, let's, let's move on to the chapters 50 and 51. We'll maybe discuss them as a set here because that's how they're presented in the Book of Mormon. They're actually the first Isaiah chapters to be quoted in 2 Nephi. This is earlier in 2 Nephi where Jacob is speaking and Nephi includes that in his, his writings here. So uh, you might not recognize this if you're in your Bible text here because unfortunately they don't have the references here. I've written them in here. Uh, and I noticed some of you had done the same yeah. thing. I, I wrote mine in right in my chapter heading where you would normally expect to see it. See uh, Second Nephi 7. Yeah, I've got the your footnote has it though. The footnote has the reference to chapter 7. So It has so a reference there. there but yep. I, I, I put it up here in the chapter heading because chapter 50 is Second Nephi 7. And chapter, chapter 51. 51 is Second Nephi 8. Uh, what about this reference of a I mean, there was a prophet contemporary with Isaiah that, uh, that talked about a woman and a covenant and going astray and coming back. Uh, how, what is this imagery of divorcement and marriage uh, as representing Israel here that we find in these chapters? Well, the longest version of it is in Ezekiel 16, but I think we can shorten it a lot and say that uh, uh, throughout the scriptures, the Old Testament, New Testament, and on into the Doctrine of Covenants, this metaphor of of the God of Israel being the husband and Israel being the bride. Or the church in the New Testament. In, in the church the in the New Testament, uh, the church in the latter days is being mm -hmm. the bride invited to the wedding feast. Uh, um, is used here as a metaphor of the relationship between the church uh, and, and Israel, that is the church slash Israel and God. And Paul uses that, of course, to, again to talk about um, the relationship between the between Christ and the church and so on and so forth. And, and the question now is, this downtrodden Israel who, who has uh, abandoned her husband, the Lord comes to her and says, where is the bill of your mother's divorcement? And the answer, of course, is there isn't one. There has never been a divorce. <laughs> uh, God is still the husband in this metaphor. And, and to whom have I put you away? Well, I didn't, I didn't put you away and I didn't sell you to any of my creditors. In those days, you could sell your wife or your children to pay off your debts. And he, he doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. Uh, and so the answer is they're still married and God is going to take his wife back in the latter days when mm -hmm. she becomes triumphant. If Israel feels distant from the Lord, if we feel distant from the Lord, it's not because the Lord has sent us away. As it says in chapter 50 verse 1, behold for your iniquities you have sold yourselves. Mm -hmm. If we ever get distant from God, we have to ask ourselves, who moved? Yeah. Now, you know, our, Vic, our, let me just point out one thing, just, just a uh, textual kind of thing, and that is in uh, verse 1, we have the Lord speaking. There really isn't a transition into verse 2, and therefore it can be read as though it's the Lord that's continuing to speak. But what we have here is the, is the servant's response to what the Lord says in verse 1, so that it is the servant that's saying, wherefore, when I came, there was no man. When I called, there was none to answer. So again, we... We have this idea of the servant responding. The Lord's made these promises, and, and initially it looks like they, they haven't come to pass, and yet as the servant moves on, wow, the Lord really has done it all. And you see that it's the servant <coughs> speaking as you look at verse 5 and 6, exactly. because it's definitely in that, in that voice. That's the Lord right. God has opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. And one of the problems that Israel has had is, I think is brought out in verse 11 at the end of the chapter, they've tried to kindle a fire themselves and to live by the light of this fire which they have lit rather than living by the light which the Lord wanted to provide them. Mm -hmm. And in the latter days, that fire is going to be eclipsed by the restoration. So right in the middle of this chapter, we just to, to, to clarify, we do have another one of these little servant songs or mm -hmm. poems, verses four through nine that is kind of the pivotal point of this chapter as, as, as Israel is trying to come back into a covenant relationship and, and instead of just living by its own light or whatever. Now, in chapter 51... Vic, too, before, before we run, let's just point out that servant and what he says he's done in verse 6 of chapter 50. I gave my back to the smiters, my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. And while that's clearly representing Israel and the indignities it suffers in order to be a light to the Gentiles, mm 
it's a great foreshadowing of what the King of Israel, the Messiah, did, relating strongly to the mistreatment of the Savior in Matthew 27 when he was beaten and even spit upon. Right. Yes, exactly. All right, chapter 51, then the last uh, chapter that, that Jacob quoted uh, there is found in 2 Nephi 8. Uh, to me, uh, it seems like we've got a little more hope out of this chapter, a little, something a little more positive that, it, that Israel can look forward to. It, in fact, I, 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 ca I call this the beckoning chapter. Okay, this is because of what the Messiah has done, this is what you are to do. You are to hearken, you are to listen, you are to awake. Uh, uh, so the Lord's really pulling them in on this one. To, here's some concrete things you need to do now. You know, it's interesting too that it seems to be addressing the Gentile nations. Uh, I mean, Israel is calling out to scattered Israel, but it's addressing it as if it doesn't know who it is, as if it's a Gentile nation. Verse 1 of 51, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from whence ye are hewn, to the hole out of which you've been digged. Verse 2, look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah that bare you. The whole world really has this lineage and doesn't know it, but that's where we have to have them look, back to the Israelite covenant if they're to be gathered to the, to the gospel. And in verse 2 he says, I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. The promise to Abraham was that through him and his seed all the families of the earth would be blessed. And we're seeing that in these days. Exactly. And not only that, we're seeing the outgrowth of that. Uh, in verse 3, that beginning word for is, is causal, okay, for this reason, that Zion shall be comforted. You know, there, Zion is going to come forth. There, there's going to be a real power here in the last days. And those elements that seem to go together with the restoration of different branches of the house of Israel, whether it's Judah or whether it's the gathering of the Latter-day Saints. In verse 3, we see waste places being comforted, the wilderness being like Eden, the desert becoming like the garden of the Lord. Yeah. And, and that which has been done to downtrodden Israel will eventually be turned around and given to the Gentiles who have uh, been the oppressors of, of the house of Israel, as it mentions there beginning in verse 17 right. uh, at the end of the chapter. And, and uh, again in verses 18 and 19, uh, I, the idea of, of, of not only gathering, but uh, in the Book of Mormon it mentions a couple of two sons that come forth. You'll notice some cross-references to Revelation referring to uh, two servants of the Lord in Jerusalem in the last days. I mean, there's obviously God has set some things apart for Israel to receive in the last days, and there are going to be some powerful, wonderful servants who are going to help bring this about. Uh, anything else uh, that you'd like to highlight here as we finish these chapters uh, 49 through 51 here today, Jeff? Well, you know, as we, as we start to wrap up, we have to type, try and think, what is, this, what is this group of chapters telling us? And it's, it's really telling us that the, the Lord of course, knew and designed the end from the beginning. And by personifying the people of Israel as, as a person talking to its own downtrodden self, the Lord is telling us through Isaiah that we need to have our, our hearts be cheered. We need to consider ourselves comforted and blessed because indeed His hand is reaching forth to gather Israel from all nations. And, and I think that's summarized best maybe in chapter 51 verse 11. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head and they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. And then maybe just one other one um, in verse 15 and 16, I am the Lord thy God that divided the sea hearkening back to the, the origin of the people of Israel, coming through the Red Sea with Moses. Well, those were our ancestors, every bit as much as they were the ancestors of the Jewish people. And that Israelite heritage goes back for many people of the world if they only knew, if they would only mm -hmm. accept the covenant. Verse 16, I've put my words in thy mouth, I've covered thee in the shadow of my hand, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and say unto Zion, Thou art my people. Sure, that's exactly what it's all about us too.
show that the covenant is still in effect, as you have said already, Paul. The marriage was never dissolved. It was there never was annulled. Never, never was a, a divorce, separation, right? but not a divorce. That's exactly right. And therefore, you still are my people, and you need to come to me. And if you'll come to me again, I, I, I will be your God. You will be my people. We're never allowed to forget that. In, in fact, the, the verse you quoted earlier here, Jeff, verse 11 of chapter 51, therefore the redeemed of Israel shall return. I, am I wrong to assume that this return could be not just a physical return, but return like a spiritual repenting, turning around, turning back to the Lord that the, would the, be a the, part of this. That's the nature of the return. The, the JST adds a little sentence, a little phrase in there that, that, that uh, emphasizes that. And, uh, they will return with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy and holiness shall be upon their heads. That holiness is what it's all about. Because the return of lost Israel is to come to the covenant of Israel, which is the restored gospel. So repentance and baptism is the act of returning and being gathered to those who are gathered of lost Israel. Well, in fact, the term holiness actually describes a people that have been consecrated for a sacred purpose. And you're not really consecrated for a sacred purpose if you haven't entered into a covenant. And that covenant has been accepted by the covenant granting party through some type of verification through the Spirit. And obviously Isaiah had that spirit and understanding. And although his words may be difficult, thank you for your help in letting us try to understand his words today. Thank you. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.